Hello and welcome everybody to our second Your Co-op Live event. Uh, when we got together earlier in the year, when it was snowing, can you believe it? Um, we asked you what you wanted us to talk about at the next event um, and you came back with lots of really interesting options, one of which was well-being. And we figured that given that it's just a little over a year since we all went into lockdown and our lives changed immeasurably, we thought that was the right topic to be going ahead with. So once again, I'm Nikki Inslee. I'm part of the community team here at the East of England Co-op and I'm joined once again by my colleague, Helen Raven. Hi, thanks, Nikki. Sorry, we're, we're doing a... <laughs> we're trying to use one of these things and it's not, it's not responding, but there you yeah. go. It's done, it's done it now. So if you see me kind of frantically do that, you know, you know what that's about. Um, so yes, we've got a really, really packed show for you this evening. Um, First up, we've got Anne Osborne. Anne is from the Rural Coffee Caravan. Uh, she's going to be talking about the support they give to people in the community and advice um, for how we can start to reconnect again once, once we can do that. Um, we've also got Dr. Hazel Harrison. She's a clinical psychologist. Um, she's from Think Avalana. And she's going to be giving us some advice on how we can improve our mental health and well-being. Also, we've got Adam Baker from Public Health Suffolk, and he's going to be talking about the positive effects of physical activity on our well-being. And finally, we've got Paul Thompson once again. And unfortunately, um, he can't be here in person to answer your questions, um, but he's done another uh, fabulous dish for us to try at home. Back to you, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> it's probably worth us explaining that Helen and I, while we are both appearing on the screen together and we are in um, our production company Green Spark Studios, we are actually socially distanced and in completely different rooms for each other. So it's quite a novel experience for both Helen and I. So um, tonight, although we can't see you, we absolutely want to hear from you as the event um, progresses. So um, just like last time, there's the opportunity for you to ask questions throughout the night. I think it's in the right hand side of your screen. Um, that's the left, that's the right. Uh, and you can fill those questions in. You'll also spot that there's a little sort of thumbs up icon in the top right hand corner of the question boxes. If you see a question that somebody else has asked that you really would like answered, if you give it a thumbs up, the more thumbs up it gets, the more popular we know it is, and the more likely it is to make it to the top of the pile of questions, as it were. Um, and we're also going to be asking you to take part in various polls and let us know how you're thinking and feeling throughout the night. So please, please make sure that you um, participate and interact with us. Um, I think it's fair to say that the last 12 months um, have seen an astonishing change for all of us. Who would have thought 12 months ago that wearing masks, social distancing and not being able to see our friends and families um, as regularly and as often as we'd like would be the norm? Um, you know, we as a business at the East of England Co-op, we're an incredibly diverse business and we had to completely change the way we operated um, in those last 12 months. So whether that was how our food retailers operated, putting screens up, restricting the number of people coming into our stores, limits on what people could buy, to the funeral business, helping people at one of the most difficult times of their lives, streaming um, funeral services so that people could participate virtually, rather like we are tonight, rather than in person. 12 months ago, my colleagues and I at the Central Support um, packed up our stuff. Some of us took keyboards and screens as well as our laptops and we've been working at home ever since. Um, we created the Community Cares Fund so we could help um, uh, vulnerable um, and at need people in our communities. Um, and we've absolutely transformed the way that we've operated. What's been really positive from our point of view and as speaking as an employee is we know that our employers have done their best to absolutely look after our well-being. They've tried really hard, whether that's through the regular well-being um, surveys that we've that allow us to understand how the organisation, the people in the organisation are feeling, to making it part of the conversations that managers are having throughout the organisation from the top to the bottom. Um, and really just looking after, trying our very best to look after the people who are serving the communities um, in and around East Anglia. Um, so much so that in the last month we've launched a groundbreaking partnership with um, uh, Suffolk Mind, um, part of which is that they're actually embedding a member of their team at the East of England Co-op so that we can put that positive mental health um, thinking and, and work um, into the everyday of what we do here at the Co-op. So it's been an astonishing year. It's been a year of change and, and, and difficulty. So 
What we really want to hear, this is your sort of first opportunity to take part in a poll now. Um, we'd like to hear what you're most looking forward to doing as lockdown eases. So hopefully you should see the poll appearing on your screen. So what is it that you're most excited about doing? Is it seeing family and friends? Is it going out to eat? Is it having that first pint in the pub? Whether it's going to the gym or some of you might even want to be getting back to the office. I'm actually quite enjoying working from home, but or is it getting away on holiday? watching and participating in sport. Wow, so I can really see you're all um, getting involved here. I think it's probably fair to say, um, yeah, it's, it's fair to say that seeing friends and family, and I can understand this, is an outright winner with sort of over seven, well over 70% of you picking that as the most important. I also noticed that um, going to restaurants and participating in sports were pretty high up there as well. So um, maybe you're doing that with friends and family as well. So that's um, really, um, a, you know, a really great way to sort of understand um, how you're feeling. Um, so uh, before I hand over to Helen, please keep remembering to ask your questions. Um, and now back to Helen and our first guest. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so. That it, you're exactly like me. I can't wait to see my family and friends, and um, we're busy sorting out the garden in the mo at the moment because uh, we can't wait to have a summer. Hopefully, a summer of barbecues. Um, but um, moving on, we are incredibly blessed in this part of the country um, to be surrounded by some beautiful, beautiful countryside, um, which is lovely to visit. But it's it can be a problem for people who are living alone, and. Um, Many of you have heard, uh, hopefully many of you have heard of the Rural Coffee Caravan. They're amazing. Uh, they're a local organisation that provide a range of services, um, just like here, uh, to people who are isolated in, in the sort of uh, rural um, countryside around us. And to tell us a bit more about this wonderful organisation, we're going to be joined by the CEO, um, Anne Osborne. Hopefully, Anne, you're there. Hello, Anne. Hello. Oh, there you Sorry. are. Yes. yes. <laughs> Just building the tension. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for joining us um, this evening. Um, like I said, many of you, uh, many of our uh, viewers at home will have heard of uh, your organisation. But, but for those who haven't, I just wonder if you could tell us a bit about what you guys do and, and where you operate. OK, so, well, first of all, we operate across the whole of Suffolk. Um, and when we come back, we will be coming back with four vehicles instead of three. So that's really quite exciting. That means we'll be able to reach even more people, in more places. But basically what we do is take these camper vans out into villages that either don't have or don't use their social amenities very much. Um, and we set up on the village green or in a lay-by or in one village on a traffic island and provide <laughs> a social space in a rural place where people can come together in a really gentle, non-threatening non-judgmental way for free tea and coffee and cake and chat so they get to meet each other they get to um, meet us they might uh, we might be introducing neighbours to each other there might be people who've just moved into the village there can be all sorts of reasons why people come along it might be that they want to um, talk about what they'd like to see happening in their village and how to make it happen we stay for two hours for some villages it's a monthly visit, for some it's a one-off, for some it's two or three times a year. We say that we're a friend to a, a rural community and different rural communities need that friendship in different ways. So we're very flexible and very adaptable in, in how we approach the whole thing. So just thinking about that adaptability, obviously we've all had to adapt over, over the last year. So, so what have you been doing uh, <laughs> during this time? How have you sort of um, been, been connecting people at the moment? Well, you can imagine, can't you? <laughs> Lockdown came and everything that we do just had to stop overnight. Or We, we run another network of coffee mornings in pubs called Meet Up Mondays, and that all just had to stop as well. Um, and we realised immediately that there was a very strong infrastructure in Suffolk that was putting all the, the key things in place, like setting up COVID hubs and, and recruiting all the, the volunteers, home but not alone, all that kind of thing. Um, so we decided that we would concentrate on uplift and positive thinking. The very first thing that we did was ask all our villages to set up telephone trees 
um, which was quite interesting. If you're under 30, you don't know what a telephone tree is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had a model, a model of a telephone tree, which we sent out to villages and to churches for congregations, um, just to make sure that people were still talking to each other. And, and one nice little story that came out of that in one village, two households were brand new. They'd only moved in days before lockdown and they actually got to know their neighbours through their telephone tree, which is nice. Oh, wow. Um, and then we turned our turned to our website as so many people did and we built the most amazing I say this because I didn't build it but we built the most amazing resource page just just superb resource page of things to do we concentrated very much on being physically distanced but still socially connected so it was things like um, pulling up a fence panel in the back garden so that you can have a, um, a physically distanced but social cuppa with your neighbours oh, or dr driveway drinks, you know, on a Sunday night at 6 p.m. or something, meeting for drinks on your driveway. Um, we filled our calendar with events that people could still take part in. So it might have been Leslie on the radio with her five minutes of exercise every afternoon, or it could have been the Royal Ballet streaming something or, or one of these tours around somewhere in the country because otherwise our diary was looking like cancelled, 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 cancelled. And, and that was that was miserable. So we filled it with other things to do. We bought flowers from a local producer who had nowhere to sell his flowers. So we bought a lot at a very, very friendly price and we went out delivering flowers. We um, created these cuppa cards that people could make, print them off, make them, put a tea bag in and post them to somebody and say, let's both have a cuppa at 10 o'clock. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be making mine, here's yours, that kind of thing. Um, we used Facebook community pages a lot because people who travel to the Facebook community pages take that information off and take it out into the community. So we were very mindful to use those. We made telephone calls. We asked people when we, when we came back, obviously we could come back and do some visiting from about August to October. So we asked people if we could keep their track and trace telephone numbers. And we've been making friendship phone calls to anyone that wanted one. Um, after we got locked down again. We've given out hugs in mugs, which is a little brown bag full of all sorts of goodies just to make you feel better. Not probably not anything that you didn't already have, but just nice, you know, so, yeah, chocolate yeah. and biscuits. And and um, you've got Adam Baker on later. His amazing packs of, of exercise cards and a resistance band went in to try and keep people in interested in keeping moving. We set up a pen pal scheme with the Royal Hospital School. We just did anything and everything we could to keep, we drove around villages just so people could see that we're, we still exist, even though there wasn't anything much that we could do. We just drove around and would stop and talk to people out of the window. We just did whatever we could to let people know that we were still there and they all still mattered. Yeah. And then in November, yeah. we started a slow cooker appeal, which I don't know if anybody has seen that, but that kind of took off like a rocket yes. I was hoping to raise a thousand pounds and we raised twelve and a half thousand pounds so and had a house we, full of slow cookers I, I hear I had a house <laughs> absolutely full of slow cookers but we've, we've distributed about 500 of those now and, and so that wow. that's been wow. really good yeah God, so I'm ex I'm exhausted just listening to that list it sounds like you've been more busy than than you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know our passion is keeping people connected so we mm. just had to constantly be creative and innovative and just think of ways that we could make that happen yeah. working with other agencies wherever we could to spread their messages um and yeah I mean collaborative working is absolutely the best way to go isn't it we work mm. very closely with you the co-op was very generous with vouchers for our slow cookers um I think one of the features that we have noticed is how everybody has been working together through this mm. last year. And I hope I hope we keep that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's it's it's learning to adapt. And it's actually all this creativity that's come out of um, come out of this time as well. I mean, people have just been so creative in the ways that we I love the idea of lifting your uh, fence panels. Yeah. Backyard <laughs> buddies, we called that. Yeah. yeah. Make a chance. <laughs> um, so sort of thinking ahead what 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 are you planning to do I mean you know we're all fingers very tightly crossed and we're all looking towards June have, have you got sort of stuff in the diary for sort of post June and yeah um, yeah we're going to continue our friendship phone calls through April and May whilst we're planning our visits we won't go out before June we feel that um, it's really important that anyone who comes to visit us feels safe mm -hmm. and so we think to, to leave it till June is probably the most responsible thing to do those visits will be COVID secure. When we were out for three months last year, people brought their own chairs and their own mugs, and we will ask them to do that again. Um, 
we we actually didn't expect many people to come last time and in fact got far greater numbers than we'd have been expecting so we are expecting to be quite busy people are desperate to see each other but they want to know they're safe they want to know that that you know um it, it, it is a covid secure environment so mm. yeah, yeah so that's what we'll be doing with and we'll we'll have four vehicles doing that so Fantastic. and hopefully the meetup mondays are going to start coming back on board as soon as they can we already know that some are asking us and are really keen to get it yeah. going again so. yeah that was such a nice idea i love i love the mm. idea of the meetup mondays um so mm. we've had some um questions in for you um one of the questions we've had is, um, how is the caravan funded? Where where do you get some sort of funding from? <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, I've been working for the caravan now for 17 years, 18 years this year, and I am forever writing funding bids. So, it's funded in all sorts of different ways. We have quite a substantial um, amount of funding at the moment from this county council which is really nice uh, we are funded a lot through the community foundation um, we have a freelance fundraiser who works hard on our behalf but a lot of the time it's 500 pounds here a thousand there you know it's it's donations as well yeah it honestly it is writing endless funding bits and it comes from all kinds of different sources yeah so we but, were well, very fortunate You've got so many examples to show that you're doing amazing stuff though. So um, just uh, one last question. Ha can the caravan go anywhere? Um, and someone's asked if, if you can visit them. They haven't said where they're from, but you know, can you can you go anywhere? Can you can yeah. people phone all, and ask? Yes, absolutely. No, no, all you have to do is phone. Phone, phone us up on 01379 Email us, use the calendar. Um, all the contact details are on the website, on our calendar. Um, we only go by invitation. We're never just going to, to descend upon you. It's, it's a village wanting us to come because they think that we can help them in some way. Uh, so just ask, yeah, we'll, we'll go anywhere that we're asked to go. Oh, all we need fantastic. is somewhere to park, permission to park. And uh, even on a roundabout. Set up, even on a roundabout. <laughs> even on a, that's in Redlingfield. We park on their triangle in the middle of their village. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, we will put all of those details on the website um, after after we finish tonight. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Pleasure. And uh, you, you are doing amazing stuff. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm exhausted hearing about what you're doing. It just, <laughs> it just sounds so lovely. It's such a We do love it. We're very lucky. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And, and like Thanks I say, for having me. Thank you. Um, all of the information about Anne and the caravan will be on our website um, later tonight. So um, uh, do check that out. And uh, now I'm going to hand over back over to uh, Nikki. Thanks very much, Helen. And that was so inspiring to hear what Anne and the team are doing there and really um, hopefully bringing a little bit of sunshine into people's lives over this last 12 months. So. Um, I think it's fair to say the audience that are watching at home tonight are going to be really, really broad and diverse. There could be recovering homeschoolers like myself and some of my friends, um, and Helen indeed, um, to um, people who are living alone or people who are living in relatively close quarters with family um, who they probably never spent so much time with um, before. So, um, And that will have had an impact on, on how all of us are feeling. So we want to, for you to tell us what well-being means to you. We've called tonight Wellbeing Matters, but hopefully you should see um, in the right-hand side of the box uh, um, an opportunity. So if you can just in a couple of words, tell us a little bit about what um, well-being means to you. Um, uh, and it's, it's quite a tricky question, I suppose, but I, I, for me, oh, there's, there's happiness. Um, I think for me, it's contentment. It's around sort of feeling safe and well. Um, oh, feel, happiness, it seems to be winning and feeling better. Some of the words that are coming through. Healthy, that's true. Biscuits, well, never a truer word. <laughs> so some of you may be able to see the word cloud that I'm looking at at home. So there's the ongoing care for yourself, healthy body and mind, being healthy and happy. There's a lot of sort of health and, and contentment and feeling positive, but happiness is the word that seems to be winning at the moment. So we'll just keep it open 
for a couple of minutes longer. And what we'll try and do as well um, in on the website tomorrow is try and take a sort of screenshot of this word cloud. Um, it's probably another one like um, telephone tree that some of you may not know what that means, but um, uh, we'll, we'll share this image tomorrow. But it's absolutely about feeling happy with yourself, being healthy and happy and contented, I think. So yes, right. Moving on now. Um, uh, I'm really delighted to um, be welcoming our next guest on to tonight's show, and that is Dr. Hazel Harrison from Think Avelina. Hello, Hazel. Hi, Nikki. <laughs> nice to have you here with us. Um, some of you may have seen um, Hazel on things like BBC Bite Size, um, teaching um, parents and um, carers about developing a growth mindset in their child. And it certainly helped me understand the power of the word yet both for myself and the kids. So <laughs> thank Good you. <laughs> so do you want to tell us, um, start off by telling us what well-being means to you? Yeah, so really, I think when I think about well-being, one of the simplest definitions that I really like is this idea about feeling good and functioning effectively. So often when we talk about well-being, people do say things like it's about feeling happy or about feeling content. And I think it is about that. But I think it's also about becoming comfortable with some of the other emotions that we might experience, too. The ones that maybe we're less excited about feeling like frustrated or sad or, um, you know, uh, angry and, and actually feeling good can sometimes mean feeling sort of aligned with understanding what we're experiencing and and kind of getting a bit closer to that but I think it's also about having that good balance so that um, the majority of time hopefully we're experiencing um, emotions that make us feel like we're alive that we're that we're aligned with the things that matter to us and then the functioning effectively part for me is about being able to live the life that you want to be able to live to be able to do your work to see the people that you enjoy spending time with to engage in your hobbies so when we talk about kind of having high levels of well-being I think what we're really describing is that aspect of um, feeling good and having those positive emotions but also being able to do the things that we really care about and for me, I suppose, in the simplest form, that's what I think about when we're talking about well-being. Well, fantastic. And I suppose that um, the description that you've given there shows how this last 12 months has probably really been tough for people to, to control some of those things that are uncontrollable for them with, with what's going on. So what are the elements of the sort of well-being and how, would, how should we be sort of looking at incorporating things in our daily lives to have a positive impact really yeah so what we know is i mean there are lots of different well-being theories and some of them range from being sort of fairly kind of simple to being really complicated but i think what we tend to find is that the same sorts of things come up when we start to think about what well-being really means in terms of a model or an idea that we can apply and so you know we did this with healthy eating didn't we we started talking about like the five a day the things that we needed to make sure that our at least five a day i think it is now isn't it so to make sure that our bodies are healthy and so what the new economics foundation tried to do is sort of come up with the five a day you know for our well-being and this has become quite popular so people might already know about this idea they use it quite a bit in the nhs now too and basically there's five elements that that we think are important to keep us feeling well and to sort of build our well-being. So being active is one of them. And I'm not going to talk too much about that because I know that Adam's going to be talking about that later on. So I'm going to talk about the other four, really. So being connected is, is one that we know is really important for our well-being. And obviously we've just heard Anne talking about the amazing things that they've been doing and making sure that people do stay connected. And I think what we're learning now as we kind of come through a year of being in lockdown and what has influenced people's mental health and what has helped them to get through this difficult time, our relationships are actually going to be one of the biggest predictors of our well-being and the things that we're really realizing that we need. You know, you asked that great question at the start. Well, what are people missing? And I'm sure that people are missing having drinks in the pub and all of those things. But it's because we're missing our friends and our family and wanting to reconnect with with those. And I think it's right that you talked about that element of sometimes maybe our relationships have changed too. We might have spent a lot of intense time with a very small group of people. Uh, and then we may be really missing the kind of wider network. So when we think about our social relationships, we can kind of imagine it like dropping a pebble into a pond. And we have those rings that are quite close to us, which might be our, you know, our family, our immediate family 
but then we ripple out from there and all of those relationships are really important for our for our well-being and they will all influence each other too so that impromptu chat that you have in the supermarket queue with someone that you don't know can be a really powerful way to take care of your well-being and will also influence then what happens when you return home and maybe you've got a little bit more energy or a spring in your step and those things have been hard too because even when we can go to the supermarket some of the the things that we use as humans to connect with each other is often our face. Mm -hmm. So now that we're covering our faces, it's diff it's more difficult to make some of those connections. But what I would say is these lines that we're all trying <laughs> desperately hard to get rid of here, <laughs> it's genuinely smiling, actually, yeah. those wrinkle. And so if you're not sure whether someone's really genuinely smiling at you, you can tell through the eyes if they're wearing a mask. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's really important that we keep connected. That's the first one. Also, it, taking notice is another area that we think is important for well-being. And, and by this, we can think about it in a couple of ways. Um, it, it's a beautiful day in Suffolk today. So I was lucky yes. enough to get out for a walk. And I was thinking about tonight and thinking about the things I might say tonight. But occasionally I kept reminding myself that I was on a walk and I should try and take notice <laughs> of what I'm actually seeing right now. The daffodils are coming out. You know, the birds are getting excited about spring. So sometimes taking notice is just about bringing your attention to the moment that you're in right now because our brains do love to kind of go back yeah. and play things over or go forward and think about what might be about to happen and we know it's really important sometimes to just help them to be in this moment right now so sometimes taking notice is about giving yourself a chance to just be in that moment. Some people do it by having a very mindful cup of coffee where they're really focusing on, you know, what they're drinking or eating or what they can see. But we can also take notice by connecting a bit with ourselves. So sometimes that means just taking notice of how we're feeling, um, trying not to be too judgmental about what we might be experiencing, just accepting some of those things um, that we're going through. So sometimes taking notice is the external thing, but I think sometimes it's also about just giving yourself a moment to recognise where you are, it's particularly when life can start to feel a bit frantic. The other area that we know is a real superpower for our well-being is giving and kindness. So what we've learned about kindness in the last few years has been really exciting because we've started to understand that actually when we give to other people, what happens in the brain is a bit lights up that would light up when we experience pleasure. So it would light up when we have chocolate cake <laughs> or when our sports team wins or when we're watching a comedy. Actually, that same part of our brain lights up when we're kind to others and we give to them. So our brains like it when we're kind, but not just that. When we're kind to others, when we find opportunity to give to others, we make it much more likely that that person will do something kind for someone else too. And then we can create this kind of amazing ripple effect of kindness where we can sort of start to spread it through communities. And, uh, you know, there's great stories about how this has happened. And it's often started with one person, you know, kind of paying some kind act forward and then um, whole communities start to do that and one of the things about kindness is it can really help us to feel like we belong too and that's something that we need we all kind of need to feel like we have somewhere that we belong and kindness can support that and the last area I guess that's really important for our well-being is about learning so you probably heard that idea like use it or lose it in relation to our brains and there's probably particular things that we've really been using our brains for over the last few months and maybe things that we've had to sort of let go of but what we do know is that learning is a really important part of our well-being and you mentioned that idea of yet uh you know that, that actually there's all sorts of things that maybe we want to learn and we haven't quite mastered them yet but what we know about our brains are that we have this ability for our brains to kind of wire and rewire throughout our entire life. It gets a bit harder the older we get, but it doesn't <laughs> mean we can't keep learning things. And actually, it's really important that we do, not just for our sort of brain chemistry, but also because it tends to help us feel that we have some control, um, that we can learn to sort of challenge ourselves, to push ourselves a little bit, but also mastering something new helps us to realise that there's other things we might be able to master too. Mm, One of the things I think about this theory, though, is that what we often find is that they all cross over. So, you know, when you're kind to someone, then maybe you're connecting with them and then that's enabling you to 
to take notice and perhaps in bringing in a new element of learning too. So although we're talking about them as sort of separate things, often when we're thinking about our well-being, we'll find things that sort of um, capture all five elements of, of well-being too. Yeah. Well, I, I, I bought a second-hand unicycle rather boldly so I'm trying to be mindful because it's Brilliant. dangerous not to uh <laughs> physical <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm fairly miserable I think my kindness is making the neighbours entertained um at my rather poor abilities <laughs> and if you join a circus then you've got connect done as well so. <laughs> exactly <laughs> So, yeah, so far, not so good. But, um, you know, it, I'm sure I'll get there. You know, I can't do it yet. Uh, <laughs> is the important thing. So um, there's some really interesting stuff that you said there and re things that really, you know, certainly got me thinking. And I'm sure our audience at home. I don't know um, if there's some questions coming through from the audience, but certainly I'd love to hear some um, uh, we've got one coming through at the moment saying um, somebody is struggling to sleep at the moment. Have you? Oh, that's really popular. Lots of people. Um, I know I've, I, I'm finding it tough too. I know Helen and I were talking about it earlier. We're both finding sleep a bit elusive. Um, have you got any tips on how we might sleep a bit better? Yeah, so sleep is a really important one for our well-being. And obviously I've not included it in the things that we've been talking about, but but those aspects of how we take care of our physical body, which includes our diet and, and exercise and, and sleep, are really important for our mental health as well. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, we sometimes forget about sort of sleep is the importance of, of, of developing what psychologists would call kind of good sleep hygiene. Uh, so, so, you know, what our bodies love and our brain's love is kind of routine and and pattern and so that's why we often find it really hard when the clocks change and we suddenly have to shift our sleeping pattern uh, because actually we do tend to sort of fall into these rhythms so it's really healthy to develop a pattern like we would have had when we were children, mm -hmm. um, you know, where there would have been maybe, I'm not necessarily saying you have to get a bedtime story, but actually nice. having a process of, you know, <laughs> good night, you know, cleaning your teeth and, and settling into bed and lowering the lights and making sure that you've not looked at screens for a while before you do that. We also know it helps to have the room temperature to be a bit colder. So you tend to sleep better if actually your, your room is a little colder than it would be maybe if during the day so that your body temperature drops a bit. Also things like not eating too, too late at night. So allowing your digestive system to have done in the kind of majority of work before you go to bed, trying not to drink too much alcohol or have too many stimulants. So some people really stop drinking caffeine after sort of lunchtime mm -hmm. if they are struggling with sleep to really make sure that caffeine's out of their system as well. Um, but I know Matthew Walker, who's done a lot of research into sleep, would also say if you're really struggling to stay asleep, get up and move around and actually come back to it because we also start to associate our room and sleep uh, in certain ways. So sometimes it's good to move out of your room if you're not sleeping and have your room just be for when you are actually able to get to sleep. Well, that's really helpful. And that sort of getting into those good habits is, is really important, isn't it? So I've got one more question here. I think we've probably only got time for one more, but do you, I'm gonna read it, so forgive me. Um, do you have any, uh, any simple cognitive behavioral therapy tips for the community, um, e.g. tips about managing worry or anxiety? Yeah, so cognitive behavioural therapy is really about kind of how we understand our thoughts and feelings and behaviour and how we connect those together. So sometimes what can be really helpful is us to sort of change the pattern because often we get into a cycle and certain thought triggers and that triggers an emotion and that triggers a certain behaviour and then we get it can go round and round and round in that. So some people find it really helpful to write their worries down so they can actually see them on a page and then to come up with kind of a counter argument. So one of the things that we might do in cognitive behavioural therapy is to kind of see how, how realistic is that thought? Because sometimes our brains can come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas that they think is necessary for us to think about. But when we get a bit of distance from it, when we write it down, we can actually sometimes start to find the facts that support that thought or don't mm -hmm. so that we can actually create a slightly different relationship with our thoughts. So sometimes we think we have 
have to believe everything that our brain tells us. So, and actually, it will tell us all kinds of things that we that don't necessarily have to listen to. So, yes. one really helpful idea is just to get a little bit of space from our thoughts sometimes. And some people find writing that down or dictating it into their phone or talking about it with someone else can just be a helpful way to maybe create a bit of distance from some of their thoughts, particularly the ones that might be anxiety provoking. Yeah, and I probably there's probably a lot of that in the middle of the night as well, isn't there? That kind of you know you can get onto a bit of a treadmill. I know I can anyway. So, um, yeah. and then um, just one final question. I'm going to squeeze it in. Um, if you could do or change one thing, um, I don't know if it's do one thing or change one thing um, to improve our well-being, what would you do? I suppose if you were sort of omni omnipotent and could wave a wand, what was it that you would do? I think it, it would have to be something around our relationships with others because I think we know that that's so powerful for our well-being mm. so I think if we can kind of wave a pandemic wand in terms of the restrictions yes. that we've been experiencing then I think being able to hug people we've forgotten the power of touch shaking people's hand pat on the back gentle touch on the arm when someone's telling you something that's really difficult you know all of these things help mm. us to feel connected they regulate our emotions they help us through these difficult moments so I think something about being able to get that closeness back with not just with our immediate you know family but I think with anyone that we you know sure when we see each other again Nikki yes. we will definitely <laughs> hug yes <laughs> please <laughs> as long as we're allowed to yes I've really missed hugging I'm a I'm a I'm a hugger um, and I found the last year really 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 hard especially with my um, immediate not my immediate family but my extended family so um so yes, that is really wonderful. Thank you so much um, for all that advice um, and, and, and all the thinking behind everything. Um, I think we're now going to be moving on uh, to um, Helen. I think we've got some delicious recipes from Paul again. I hope it's as good as sausage casserole because that's become a firm family favourite for us. <laughs> mine too, actually, mine too. Um, Wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? And uh, God, so much food for thought, actually. Um, but uh, now on to actual food. And during that segment, my stomach was really rumbling. So I do apologise. And it's probably only going to get worse now. Um, but uh, so now we've got um, Paul Thompson back again. Like I say, unfortunately, he can't be with us um, this evening. But we uh, once again, we have challenged him to uh, create something uh, nutritious and healthy um, and uh, we know that um, a healthy diet contributes to our well-being. Um, we all know that. I mean, uh, speaking of biscuits, my family has actually given up biscuits, which is interesting for Lent. So um, that's another story. I won't go into that. Um, but uh, lots of uh, lots of people, even me, um, have turned to cooking, particularly uh, baking during lockdown, and we found it quite therapeutic. Um, what Paul's going to show now is a really fantastic um, meal. It's a roasted squash, kale and coconut dal with homemade chapatis uh, for us to try. He filmed this a few days ago, um, but uh, some amazing ingredients and, uh, and it really makes you very hungry. I've watched it already. And uh, so uh, check this out. So first up, I'm going to be making the chapati dough. Now, chapati dough is one of the most simple forms of bread. It's just flour and water. And it's a really good one to get the kids involved and get them cooking with you. So I've got 300 grams of wholemeal flour. You can use white flour or um, gluten-free flour if you have uh, intolerances. Um, just a pinch of salt and, uh, and water. So what's a good idea? Just take a pinch of flour out, out of the bowl um, so that we can dust the surface and, and knead this when we get round to it. I'm just going to put a pinch of salt into the flour and gradually add the water whilst mixing it around with my hand and uh, you should see the dough slowly come together. We want this quite a quite a, a sort of soft workable dough. Okay now the dough is coming together I'm just move it around the bowl and pick up any remaining flour. And what we want to do is take the, uh, the flour we put aside, sprinkle it onto a work surface and we're going to, uh, and we're going to knead the dough. Now this is, this is the bit that the kids will really love. You can be as rough as you like. You can really push your hands, beat, feel free to throw anything you like. And we're going to need to uh, 
knead this dough for about five minutes just to get the, um, the gluten working through and make the dough nice and elastic. So now we've been kneading the dough for about five minutes. It's come together nicely and we just need to let the dough rest. So I'm going to pop that into a tray, drizzle a bit of oil on top and, uh, and cover it in cling film and we'll leave that to rest whilst we get on with making the dal. Now first up we're going to take a butternut squash and we're just going to peel and dice this into centimetre centimetre cubes. Okay and then we'll get a roasting dish and we're just going to pop the squash into the roasting tray, drizzle the squash with a little bit of oil, this is just vegetable oil and then we'll pop the squash in the oven for half an hour to roast. Uh, we're using the oven at 180 degrees. Now if you don't have uh, butternut squash or you're not that keen on it, sweet potato, aubergine, courgette are really great alternatives and can be prepared and, and roasted off in a very similar way. Now we're going to take a pan and we're just going to heat this, heat this up slightly with a a tablespoon of vegetable oil and to that pan we're going to add one red onion that I've just sliced, two cloves of garlic that have been crushed and a red chilli but feel free to add more chilli if you like a hot a hot and spicy dish. Now the uh, the onions will take about two or three minutes to soften up and as they're softening you can weigh out your lentils. I have 200 grams of red lentils that have been washed and drained. Okay, now the onion's softened, I'm going to add the lentils to the pan and we're going to add at this point some curry powder. Now I've got a medium curry powder here but feel free to use a slightly hotter one if you prefer a hotter dish. So I'm going to add two tablespoons of curry powder to the lentils along with some vegetable stock just using a cube and 250 mils of water that I've made up, a tin of um, chopped tomatoes and a tin of coconut milk. Okay and then we'll bring this bring this together and this is going to take about 15 15 minutes to simmer away and cook the lentils. Great, so now that our dal is on the heat and simmering away, we can return to our chapati dough. Um, the chapati dough is now rested and it's nice and soft. What we need to do is divide this up into four balls. So I'm just gonna take a, a knife and cut this into four. And then take one of these sections and we just want to roll it out with a rolling pin. We want the chapati to be quite, quite thin. We're talking just under half a centimetre in thickness. Okay, now once we've rolled our chapati out, we're going to heat a frying pan without any oil. So a dry frying pan, just place it into the dry frying pan. Now this will take, take about 30 seconds to a minute on each side. And what we're looking for is just a nice bit of colour underneath and it will start, start getting these brown dots. Okay, so if you can see there, nice brown dots as the chapati cooks. So here are the chapatis we've now cooked off um, and we can set these aside whilst we finish our dal. So I'm just going to we turn the dal to the heat over here and I've got a bag of kale. This is a 150 gram bag of kale and I'm going to add this to the dal and this will just take a couple of minutes to wilt through. And then our squash that has been in the oven roasting uh, for half an hour should, should be ready. I'm going to take the squash and just add this to the dal with the kale 
and turn it through. This will just, just need a couple more minutes to, um, to come together. Okay, now we're all good to dish up. So we're going to take a bowl and serve up a portion of our lovely roast squash, coconut and kale dal. And we can serve our fresh chapatis alongside this. Now it's probably worth mentioning at this point that the dal can be frozen um, and as long as it's uh, thoroughly defrosted and reheated it's good to serve time and time again. And this is a great dish to get the family together, take time away from, uh, from general life and sit down together. Wow, I'm so hungry now. <laughs> um, so I promise I'll be back in the kitchen uh, to try that one. Um, Paul uh, picked some great ingredients there. Uh, squash, which we know is rich in uh, vitamin C, and uh, kale, which is one of those real superfoods um, packed with vitamins, calcium and potassium. So uh, a really healthy meal there. And um, don't worry if you were scribbling down bits and you missed things, we'll, we'll put all that information on our website. And he's also done some more uh, recipes for us, which, uh, which will pop on there as well. Um, as Paul mentioned in the film and, and Hazel sort of mentioned earlier, um, whether it's sitting down to eat a meal with your family or whether it's just taking time to, to lay the table and to really enjoy and sort of really think about what you're eating, the food that you've prepared, um, food can play such an important part in our health and our, our well-being. So, um, you know, if you can try that at the weekend and uh, sort of really enjoy it, because I, I know I... I think I'll really enjoy that, hopefully when I get around to cooking that at the weekend. But um, now uh, back to Nikki. Thanks, Helen. Uh, I'm really hungry as well, <laughs> having looked at that. Um, so before I introduce our next de uh, guest, it's an opportunity for you guys to get involved again. Um, so to take our minds off the delicious food and, the, uh, and, and dinner in general, um, we want to hear a little bit more about how you've been keeping active during lockdown. Hopefully you'll see a poll appearing um, on your screens now and let us know what you've been doing to keep active. Um, I've got myself a dog, um, so I'm out and about doing dog walking now, which has been great for me for all sorts of reasons. Um, have you been, do like Helen, have you been doing Joe Wicks or other YouTube exercises? Um, I know um, my mum has continued doing her Pilates um, online with her, her local teacher. Um, okay, so the results are coming in. So uh, nine, over 90% of you are going out for a walk. I think that we are so blessed, aren't we, in this part of the world with um, so many choices. And I also saw there was a lot of keen gardeners um, on those results there as well. So people really staying connected with nature, I think, which if we think that's what Hazel was talking about earlier, really, really important an opportunity for you to keep your mental and physical health um, um, going well. So I'm delighted now to invite um, Adam Baker um, from Public Health Suffolk to join us. Hello, Adam. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for joining us um, this evening. It's a pleasure. Um, it's a pleasure. So, I'm feeling quite hungry at the moment. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I could always smell it. It was just like, ah. Oh, it looked great, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about exercise. <laughs> Keep we our are. minds uh, focused. So can you tell us a little bit about why physical activity is so important for all our well-beings? Yeah, yeah, of course I can. Um, I mean, from our perspective, I think, or from my perspective, I think it's it's about the, the holistic benefits it, it gives you to your physical health and to your mental health and, and, and to your social health as, as well, actually. And um, we do hear a lot about the, the importance of physical activity to physical health, particularly things like managing weight and, and, and chronic in illness. And it's hugely important. You know, we, we know that regular physical activity can help prevent or manage over 20 chronic conditions and, and diseases. And there's a wonderful quote which gets talked about quite a lot, which is if exercise was a pill, it would be the most cost effective drug ever invented. And, yeah. and I think that really does relate and resonate with the benefits it has on, on physical health. But we often don't really hear so much talk about the benefits it has to our emotional well-being. And I know, you know, you, you've talked about going out for a walk with the dog and, and Hazel talked about going out for a walk this afternoon. And when you come back from a, a walk, you can really sense and feel the benefits you've had of 
of getting out, getting some exercise and, and, and getting some fresh air. And, and we know even short bursts of 10 minutes of, of brisk walking increases mental alertness, your energy and, and, and gives you a positive mood. You know, I, I heard Paula Radcliffe talk about running uh, not so long ago, and she was talking about how sometimes it's quite difficult to persuade yourself to go out. It's, it's a bit of a hurdle. You know, it's oh, it's easier to watch the TV or something like that. Yeah. But she said she'd never, ever heard anybody come back from a run and go, oh, I really wish I hadn't done that now. Yeah. Everybody comes back thinking, yeah, that was really, really enjoyable. I feel so much better for it. I might feel a little bit achy, but in my mind and body, I feel a lot better for it. And I think there's we don't hear it so much now, but certainly when I was a child, you used to hear that phrase, healthy body, healthy mind. Yeah, and I think that's that's really, uh, really relevant. Yeah. Um but I think yeah. in terms of social well-being, which was the third area that I mentioned, I think it's perhaps been one of the most difficult things for people during lockdown because they haven't been able to meet their friends. They haven't been able to go to group activity or group exercise. Um, and that comes back to, I think, Hazel's point about keeping connected and the importance of keeping connected. It's, it's lovely, isn't it, when we go to a, an event or an activity with like minded people and we're we're enjoying something uh, collaboratively and. Mm we haven't been able to do that so i think that keeping connected has been really difficult and, and people's social well-being has has been impacted um yeah. as a result of it it's that sense of shared experience i think isn't it that you know whether it's physical activity or anything it's that sense of togetherness that is is really difficult isn't it but so um, yeah i think so I'm I'm really keen to hear a little bit more about keep moving suffolk so Anne actually mentioned it right at the beginning of the show and how um uh, uh, they've been using it with um, out in their communities. I know we're um, we're on board with that, and there's more information available on our website. But I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I must say, Anne's been a, is a brilliant support and advocate. Yeah, amazing of, of the work that we do, and, and, and the work that they do is is, is fantastic. Yeah. It really is. Um, so we moved really quickly when um, lockdown number one was put in place to um, develop a campaign called Keep Moving Suffolk, which is all about trying to help people um, become active or stay active um, during lockdown. And we heard a lot, didn't we, um, on national prime ministers' um, announcements and briefings about exercise and how we we're allowed to do exercise. Um, but our options were really restricted. So what we wanted to do is, is provide a, um, a source of inspiration and advice and opportunities and ideas for people to, to, to stay or remain active um, during that time. And, um, it, it, it revolves around a, a, a multimedia campaign. Um, we've got a, a website, keepmovingsuffolk.com. I'll give it a bit of a plug. Um, we'll have links on our website, so uh, we'll excellent, make it easy excellent. for everyone. <laughs> yeah, good work. Um, and that basically um, just provides lots of opportunities. It's a one-stop shop, effectively, about, around physical activity. And um, the sections on staying active, on your well-being, on exercise for children... Um, there's activity challenges and, and, and there's blogs from a range of trusted experts and um, enthusiasts as well. Um, so that was has been the real focus of our work. But we've also developed a, um, a range of other initiatives and activities that we, we hoped that would keep people active during, during this time. And if I, if I mention three, if I've got time yeah. um, and, and I mentioned our activity packs at the start and, you know, we, we developed and we recognised that there's lots of people struggling to be active. There's lots of people shielding, um, people um, less confident to go out or not able to go out. So we felt we wanted to develop something that um, supported them to be active in their own home. So we produce activity packs and we work with people like the Royal Coffee Caravan and various other agencies to distribute them across the county. Um, and that's gone down incredibly well. Um, it's exercises on exercise cars, one for every day of the week with a resistance band and further contacts and information for people. Um, and if they go to your website, um, yes. they can have a look at them. If they come to our website as well, they can, which is linked off your website, yeah. um, you can request a, a pack to be sent to you as well. So um, they're still available and we recognise that people will still want to be active in their own home um, in the longer term. That's um, fantastic. Um, I don't yeah, know if there's we... any questions coming in from people, um, but um, uh, one of the things I just did want to mention as well was we um, have recently, oh, hang on, we have got some questions coming in. So have you got any tips for people watching who might not be that mobile 
and who want to improve their physical activity. I think you sort of alluded to that just, just a moment ago, didn't you? Yeah, I think the exercise packs are a great um, way of doing that and a great opportunity to do it. Um, I think the advice from me would be that you don't need a lot of space. You can do stuff in, in your own home. Um, you can be more active, whatever. Um, and then you can enjoy the say uh, you can enjoy the benefits of being more active, no matter how active you are at the moment. Just small amounts of activity can mm. can help you, uh, and you will feel the benefits of it. Um, the I would say start slowly, build up gradually. Um, if you're worried. Um, or you're a bit unsteady on your feet or have dizzy spells or things like that, then do consult your doctor before you, you start just to ease your, your concerns. Um, but most people can be active um, without, having to, without having to worry about it. But if you do have concerns, do consult your, your doctors, listen to your body, yes. do what feels comfortable. <laughs> if, you, if you don't feel up to it one day, that's fine. You know, it's not a problem. You know, do it the next day. Um, well, and I think but there are so many ways you can do it. Yeah, you talked about sort of feeling a bit stiff and things after exercise before. I used to work with a woman that always said after exercise, that's what she knew she was alive. If she was a bit stiff after <laughs> she'd done a bit of exercise. So that's um, important. Um, I thought it would be a good idea as well to mention um, we've we've just pledged some support to the Suffolk Mind Sammy the Ski Sea Squirt. Um, I've had trouble saying that today. Uh, Sammy the Sea Squirt <laughs> uh, project. So they're doing a crowdfunding project, aren't they? Which is about this book for Sammy um, that is all around um, young people's mental health, isn't it? The, the hope is to get a, a book into every reception age, ch reception age child's book bag. Um, and I know you guys are supporting that project as well, aren't you? I wondered if you wanted to just talk a little bit about why exercise and mental health is so important for young people too yeah absolutely um i mean fundamentally sammy the sea squirt is a is a brilliant initiative and, and i would say to people go and have a look at the uh, the suffolk mind website that talks about it and it's all about movement and mental health it's about helping children understand how important it is to be active but it's also about helping their parents to yeah. understand how uh, understand how important it is for their children to be active and um the importance for me is about physical activity is a really important building block for life. You know, when, when we are designed to move, our bodies are designed to move and children are no exception. Yes. Um, and if we want to maintain good health, then um, we need to move to do that. Um, the, there's some quite frightening st statistics at the moment, stories, but it, I'll just quote one, which is the least fit child of 30 years ago in a class of 30 children would now be one of the top five fittest children wow. in that class so scary, um, isn't it? It, wow. it is it's really scary but physical activity helps manage weight um, mm. it makes children more resilient it build, helps them build confidence and improves their social skills and um, of course one of the things that doesn't get often talked about is there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that physical activity can help children's attainment um, at mm. school it improves their concentration it improves their behavior and it, it um, improves their ability to learn so um, active children um, do better at school which is is often a really important point for, for yeah, parents hugely. and for teachers I think it's so important for their confidence as well actually isn't it they, it really builds confidence being physical um, certainly I see that in my own children I think so, so. yeah well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been really, really useful. And um, we will absolutely make sure that there are links um, to everything on our website, to all the Keep Suffolk Moving stuff, um, the crowdfunder information for Sammy the Sea Squirt, uh, <laughs> and so much more. So thank you again, Adam, for joining us this evening. Um, no problem. Bye. Um, thank you. Uh, right, I think I'm handing back to Helen now. You are, sorry, I was just getting my notes because my um, clicker was uh, playing up again, but it's back, so amazing. <laughs> so um, we're going to end uh, with uh, one more poll. Um, we've talked about the, uh, the future a lot um, this evening and what we're looking forward to when uh, we start easing out of lockdown. But um, there's also uh, been a lot of activity, as we've seen from Anne during lockdown. So we want to know what you've been up to and what has got you through um, this last year at home. Um, you can click on one more, um, more than one of the options. Hopefully they're there on your screen. Um, so have you been spending more time with your loved ones? 
have you been working from home like uh, like me and uh, Nikki um, doing home improvements gardening baking exercising arts and crafts learning a new skill I know lots of people have been volunteering in the community um, and also using technology um, like zoom or house party to chat to friends um, I know me and my husband uh, are doing sort of weekly uh, quizzes. We haven't stopped those. They're still going after a year uh, with our friends, which is, uh, which is great because we're actually seeing them more than we usually do. But it looks like you're all, um, again, really green <laughs> fingered and you've been um, gardening, which is fantastic. And uh, I can't wait to get out in my garden at the weekend because uh, like I say, we've been doing loads in the garden. So um, yeah, fingers crossed that the weather stays. Um, but fantastic! That's that's so great to see that um, so many of you have been joining your enjoying your garden. Absolutely. Well, and thank you everyone for sticking with us um, through the show tonight. Hopefully, you found um, it entertaining and interesting, and you've picked up some useful tips and advice there. I now have a very exciting job with the sound effects. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you get ready, Helen, get ready. Uh, so um, we're going to announce the winner of the competition. So when everybody registered for the event, um, you were put into a competition to win £50 worth of store vouchers. So I need the, the drum roll, please. <laughs> Fantastic. And the winner is Sylvie from Colchester. Um, so uh, the team will be in touch with you really shortly um, to make sure that we get those £50 um, worth of shopping vouchers out to you as soon as possible. They're in an envelope on my home working desk ready to go. So um, uh, we'll get them out to you as quickly as we can. So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I've certainly learned um, a lot this evening. And as we've mentioned, there is going to be an enormous amount of the content from tonight and links and documents and all sorts of things, and possibly even some information on what a phone tree is. Um, I think we should probably put that on uh, for some of our younger viewers, because uh, I certainly know what one is. That obviously makes me very old. <laughs> So, um, so thank you very much and, and over to Helen. Okay, thanks Nikki um, and thank you at home. It has been so lovely and we love it when we see all your kind of comments coming mm. in and you know and responding to the polls because it means we're not alone but yes. I mean I know it looks like we're together but um, we're not. We're not. <laughs> we're in separate rooms. Nikki's down the hall from me here so uh, yes we're all standing on our own. It's very lonely. Um, but um, we want to say a massive massive thank you um, to everyone who's uh, joined us. So uh, Dr Hazel Harrison, uh, Anne Osborne, Adam Baker and, of course, um, of course Paul Thompson. Um, we'll be running some more of these. Um, hopefully you'll be pleased to hear uh, during the course of this year. Um, in the next couple of minutes, we'll be sending you an email um, asking for your feedback. So um, please do tell us what you, um, what you think of tonight's show. Also tell us what, you, um, what you'd like to see, um, see more of. Um, we are going to be doing our next um, Co-op Live event on uh, Thursday the 24th of June and that's going to be celebrating our um, Source Locally um, campaign. We're going to be uh, looking at the produce that we um, produce in the region, we're going to meet it, um, some of our local suppliers and uh, we'll also be uh, doing some uh, more cooking demonstrations but hopefully I'll have something to eat before, um, before those. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited about this Source Locally one because hopefully we're going to be out and about for it, aren't we? So, yes, um, yes. Hopefully we're crossed. going to be doing some uh, <laughs> tasting and uh, that will be... <laughs> yes, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, before then, another uh, date for your diary. Um, annual members meeting is on Thursday the 13th of May. Um, more information on, on your co-op live and the annual members meeting will be on our website, on our social channels. So um, keep your eyes peeled for those. Um, in the meantime, uh, take care of yourself, take care of each other um, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.